Welcome to The Art of Medicine, the program that explores the arts, business, and clinical aspects of the practice of medicine. I'm Dr. Andrew Wilner, and my guest today is Dr. Ken Somerville. Welcome, Ken. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Ken, uh, well, we've known each other. It's, it's decades, right? And <laughs> yeah. uh, you were kind of my biggest connection to the world of pharma. And ah. uh, you've spent a lifetime in pharma. And uh, I, I wrote to you because I thought you had retired and with, were then sort of free to say whatever you wanted. And, uh, but I understand that may not be entirely the case that you've actually got a new temporary, uh, you know, not retired yet. But what I wanted to get from you today is uh, some advice for clinicians who are thinking about the pharma industry. Uh -huh. I remember in my training, you know, pharma was considered to be uh, the, the dark side. And uh, I think that may have changed. And uh, so tell us your story. How did you get interested in pharma and which companies have you worked with and, and how, how is it for sure. us? Great. Well, thanks. Thanks, Andy. And uh, again, thanks for having me on this program. I hope I can uh, dispel some of the assumptions people make about the industry because I, I do like it very much. It's, it's worked well for me. But like everything else in life, it's not for everybody. And it's, uh, it's a part of medicine. It's, it's not something that's outside the medical world. It, it's a part of it. And I think it's one that we should um, know and understand at least because there are some misconceptions, I think. Um, and I think we're going to see it. Obviously, this past year, we saw how valuable the pharma industry can be in getting the vaccines out with COVID. So um, let's think about that first, but I'll, I'll give you, the, you know, how it happened with me. Um, I was in private practice for over 11 years in uh, central Pennsylvania, in Lebanon, Pennsylvania, uh, and I was basically the neurologist for the county, <laughs> and that was fun, and it was nice, and I had wonderful help. Uh, from Dr. Brennan, who was the head of neurology at, at uh, Hershey at the time. He was only about 10, 15 miles away or so, and he was wonderful. Um, and I did have some part-time helpers uh, as well. I had uh, uh, Carl Ellenberger, the neuro-ophthalmologist, was uh, also working with me. So I wasn't completely alone, but pretty much, you know, it was a lot of, uh, I call a lot of uh, work that didn't allow me time to do much of anything else. And out of the clear blue, a former colleague who had uh, helped train me gave, um, it was Neil Sussman, called me and said, you know, how would you like to uh, uh, do research in epilepsy? Now, uh, epilepsy was always sort of my favorite uh, in, in neurology. Um, I got an interest in it, in, you know, in medical school, and then it grew after that. Um, I didn't see a tremendous amount of epilepsy where I was, uh, but I did see some and uh, found it fascinating and interesting. Also finding out that, um, you know, it, it was hard for physicians to use the newest things. There weren't that many new drugs then. You know, we had phenobarbital, dilantin, everybody remembers those days. And then of course, uh, valproate had just basically uh, come out, but no one was using it much. Um, and you could see that it was really making a difference for a lot of people's lives. So I had a very positive kind of um, uh, opinion of the pharmaceutical industry for, for several reasons, but that was among them. And with Dr. Sussman's call, um, I had looked at advertisements for uh, joining the industry and I thought, oh, well, you know, gee, if I join the industry, I won't, you know, see patients as much. Well, We'll talk about that in a minute. It, it, that, that's something you really have to decide on your own. But um, um, I thought, you now this is fascinating. And, you know, I'm really, if, if I'm going to be doing this forever, just being on night call, I'll never really progress or learn more. So maybe it's time for a change. And so I joined the pharmaceutical industry. The, the company I joined no longer exists. It was Marion Merrill Dow. And the drug was, believe it or not, by Gabitrin which we all know had its problems, but did eventually get approved in infantile spasms. But at that time, it, they were developing it for uh, um, partial seizures in adults, basically, which most of the drugs get approved for. Um, but it was also thought to have this intramyelinic edema problem, and there were um, 
evoke potentials and MRI scans that were being taken to look for this in humans. It had happened in monkeys, but, but not in humans. Um, and this was before the visual field problem came up. That, that was discovered a little later. But at any rate, um, you know, I joined Marion Merrill Dow and Vigabitrin was having its problems as we, as we know. And then I was recruited by Abbott and I went over to Abbott for an, over nine years. Now, here's the thing, you know, when you join the industry, depending on your background, you may have to learn a lot. And having been a country neurologist, if you will, I, I didn't have a lot of um, background that prepared me for it. So it took me a while to learn the ropes, so to speak. And, and that's something you really have to do. Uh, I think for the most part, if you join the industry, you have to learn how the industry works, uh, how it's set up. And we'll talk a little more about that, but, but that's a, a really important thing. So I started off as what was known as a clinical scientist. And then at Abbott, I was an, associate, an assistant uh, director. And I was supposed to, uh, I was hired to, to uh, develop Tigabine or good old Gabitril, which really was not much of a commercial success. Uh, but, um, you know, that was my primary duty. And then another neurologist who was, who was at Abbott left, and then I was given Depakote as well. So at Abbott, I, I had, you know, two, uh, an up and coming drug, and then one that was well established. But the interesting thing was, as, as you know, Valproate had both um, epilepsy and then migraine, and uh, was approved um, basically for epilepsy, and then later for mania, which was the first new drug in uh, uh, manic depressive disorder, I think in 20 years, all they had was lithium up to that time. So I got to meet psychiatrists, and I started to learn how drugs can be useful in one area as well as another, and that you work with different specialties. And this went on over nine years, and I ended up having, I think, about four or five approvals, um, where I was basically the medical person writing a lot of the documents and uh, uh, interacting with the FDA and learning a tremendous amount. It was just, you know, a, a really good time. Um, but at that point, you know, I thought, well, you know, here I am. I'm, I got to be senior medical director. But I got a lot of approvals, but didn't seem to go anywhere. Um, most of the time in, at Abbott, the um, um, antibiotics were uh, and HIV were really the focus was on those things. I mean, obviously, neurology was important, but you know, was not the, the center of attention. So I, I was offered a, a position as vice president at uh, Schwartz Pharma. That's another company that no longer <laughs> exists. Um, and there, I got to work not only on lecosamide. Uh, in epilepsy, but uh, also the Nupro reticotine patch for Parkinson's. So here was another area of neurology to get involved in. Uh, we were uh, at Schwartz. That was great. It was a foreign company. I got to go over to Germany. I got to use my very elementary German. <laughs> I found how poorly I spoke German in that, but it was fun. And, and all the Germans spoke English. So, I mean, it was um, not a challenge to use German, but it was fun. That was something else that, you know, was kind of uh, a difference. And, you know, I was in Germany quite a bit. It was nice to be uh, in another country and learn how they're doing things. Um, and so then, uh, I, you know, we were taken over by uh, UCB, uh, the Belgian company, and got to do some work on Kepra, as well as uh, continue with Lacosamide, which has been quite successful. Um, and then it was basically, I wanted to try something else that was uh, um, where I was in charge of a uh, of a unit and a product. So I moved over to another company that doesn't exist called King Pharmaceuticals. Uh, they were based in New Jersey, but their, their research was here in North Carolina. And there I worked on abuse deterrent opioids, which was something I really didn't know too much about, but I got to learn about drug addiction. And also um, there was the, the types of trials they do, you know, in other words, uh, trials um, looking at drug liking and addiction and so forth. And that turned out to be extremely valuable for me later on. Um, so everything you learn sort of builds up. And um, we were taken over again, um, this time by Pfizer. And so there it was fun. I got to go up to New York and uh, uh, interact with, I mean, the resources in that company, as you wait, may well imagine, were spectacular. It was just wonderful, all the things that, you know, you could, you could do there. Uh, wonderful people. <clears throat> but I was a little, after a few years, I thought, well, you know, abuse to turn opioids is not, not something I want to keep doing forever. I mean, it was, it was good for the time. I had several approvals, um, you know, with abuse to turn opioids. Um, but then I got another call out of the blue, you know, these calls out of the blue are, are 
interesting. Um, and this was a former colleague at Abbott who asked me if I wanted to work on epilepsy again. And I thought, oh my goodness, of course I would. And uh, he said, yes, we have a drug, it's called cannabidiol, and we're looking at it for uh, seizures. And I thought, oh, this sounds terrific. And GW, of course, is a British company, and my family is British, so, you know, that was nice. Got to go over to London. <clears throat> um, but basically, uh, we went from the ground up working with cannabidiol to um, design a, a development program. So that was fun to develop, you know, to develop a program with other people, of course. No one does one thing on their own. But it it was just great. And that, I, mean, I have to say, the people in that company, the cooperation there was just wonderful. It, it was just such a, uh, a real pleasure to work with them. Um, everyone had in their minds, we were going to help the children and meeting the families of uh, these children with very horrendous epilepsy, as you might know with Trave and Lennox Gasteau, um, was so rewarding. They were such wonderful people. They, um, you know, just were, you know, uh, spectacular people who, you know, had tough lives, but, you know, they, they just were so cooperative and, and had really helped to get that drug approved at the FDA advisory, as, as we know. But at that point, I was uh, retirement age. <laughs> so at that point, I, I took retirement. Um, but I did uh, continue to work with GW for a while, um, reviewing data. And then I, uh, you know, went into the consultancy where I am now, but I was just uh, basically hired part-time by Xenon Pharmaceuticals to work on several drugs they have in their pipeline for epilepsy. And again, so it's, you know, um, deja vu all over again. It's great to be working, um, you know, with these products and they're wonderful. It's a Canadian company. So, you know, again, each, each company you go to has its own kind of way of doing things and has its own kind of milieu. So you have to learn that. Uh, but the people there seem to be wonderful. They're very enthusiastic. And I think there is this uh, sense that you're really doing something that will help a lot of people rather than just helping one individual patient, which is wonderful too. We all know that. Um, but here you're, you're really helping a whole population of people. So it's a little different. So that's where we are now. It's been a, a long and interesting <laughs> progression over the years. Yeah, that was a great story. And I had a, a lot of questions in my mind as you went along. <laughs> I didn't want to interrupt because you're doing a, a beautiful job of kind of laying it all out. And um, well, first, I want to go back all the way to the beginning. You're in practice. You know, I, I was in private practice before and yeah, I mean, there is this sense. At, at one point, I was a solo neurologist in a 300-bed hospital. So mm. I had no nurse practitioner, physician assistant. You know, it's just me doing all the consults, you know, from morning till night. I had some help. Telemedicine was just starting, and uh, Yale was down the road. So they would take the strokes mm -hmm. in the middle of the night. Oh, otherwise, wow. Otherwise, uh, everything, you know, then I'd see them in the morning. And it just, you know, you're just kind of on a treadmill. Every morning, there's a big new list, yeah. and, you know. Oh, boy, yeah. Right. And, and it never uh -huh. stops. And it's very hard to sort of step away from that and say, well, I think I'll learn about, you know, Dravet syndrome. It's like, no, you know, beep, 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 you know, off you. Off right. You <laughs> so there I, I've done a lot now because of my work in locum tenens with uh, physicians who are considering non-clinical careers. Mm -hmm. you know, this is a big topic now. And there are many physicians, uh, John Jerica is one I work with, whose whole specialty is, is helping physicians, you know, consider non-clinical careers because they're, they're stuck on an unhappy treadmill. So I want, I want you to go back in your story. I mean, here you are it, nine years into a successful practice. You've, you've got your turf, right? You've got patients. Yeah. You're good at what you do. You've got your resources, your network. Uh, you're making an adequate living, I assume. I mean, there's mm -hmm. always the possibility to make more, but you know, you're you're doing okay. And then this call comes in, and you go, "Yeah, non-clinical career, that'll work." So take me through some of the thinking, you know, that mm -hmm. you had. Where, did you see this as a a baby step or or a leap? Because you know, it's a it's a bridge that's hard to come back from. Um, you know, to go back into private practice if you've been out for a few years is is almost impossible because of regulations and malpractice and accreditation and so I mean, it's, it's a big leap what 
what what were the personal things that that drove you across that bridge yeah, oh thanks for asking that andy because that that was probably one of the toughest decisions in my whole life um and it took over a week and and the first decision i made was not to not to take it <laughs> and part of that was that first of all in lebanon i you know had i had been active politically for a, a judge uh, to be elected who was a very honest guy and i'm still happy about that um, we had wonderful friends at church. Um, our sons were growing up and, you know, had lots of friends. And then I thought, boy, you know, my patients, I, you know, had a number who I had taken care of for years. That wasn't an easy one. It really wasn't. But when I made the decision to stay, my wife wouldn't talk to me. <laughs> so that had a real impression. <laughs> you know, she said, this is a new beginning for you. And, you know, I see what's happening to you here. And I think we have to change. So I have to, I have to give, I have to give my wife tremendous credit anyway for everything. But that was one where she sort of put her foot down, and I called back. And of course, at Mary and Merle Dow, they were kind of shaken because they thought, well, this guy said yeah, no, and now he's saying yes, and can we trust this guy? And so they had additional interviews with me, and it was decided, you know, to go ahead. Now, interestingly enough. Um, in my family, my, my father at the time was, was, was alive and he was in corporate USA for years, mainly at RCA. And he had said, you know, if they're giving you a good deal and this is what you want, take it. My brother uh, thought he had not had good um, uh, experiences in, in, the, uh, in the corporate world. He was at Boeing and, and some other companies. Um, and he said, you know, they're gonna rule your life and you're gonna get moved around and blah, blah, blah. Well. We moved out to Cincinnati, where I was supposed to supposed to be. And that night, we were told good news and bad news. The good news is the project's going well. The bad news is you move to Kansas City next year. And I thought, whoa, maybe my brother was right, you know. So we moved around, and you know, we went to Kansas City, and I saw you know that Mary Merrill Dow and Bike Abitron were having problems, and I thought, well, maybe I better go on somewhere else. And Abbott recruited me. Then we had to move up to Chicago. But then we stayed in Chicago over nine years, and that worked out fine. But you know, my my son, my oldest son, was a teenager then. He had a lot of um, anger over it. There was, you know, some some real problems. But you know, it all sort of got better with time. And so, you know, the what's the bottom line here, Andy? I, <laughs> it's a tough decision. And like I said, I I wanted, you know, I I was work, I really missed my patience and missed, you know, the camaraderie and, and all the things we had built up where I was. Um, and, but, you know, it, it is possible. I know you, you had said a few minutes ago, well, you know, once you make the leap, that's it. Well, yeah, that's true. But I do know at least one person who joined the industry. He was in it. I knew him at Abbott, I'm pretty sure, um, for a couple of years, and he really didn't like it at all. And he left and went back to practice. So it can happen. But you're absolutely right. It's very difficult. Very difficult indeed. Let's so that's some of the things. I mean, there's personal, there's professional, um, and you know we can talk about some of the other things that, excuse me, help you in the pharmaceutical industry or things that may deter you from it. So, I I had my own kind of brush with uh, going into uh, <laughs> industry. Uh, I worked independently as a medical journalist and consultant for ten years, outside of practice. Mm. Mm -hmm. And um, and I was speaking about the new drugs. And over time, the new drugs I was talking about weren't new anymore. <laughs> I had been involved in their development, you know, doing clinical trials and so on. Mm -hmm. I was kind of the, an epilepsy expert. But over time, I was sort of getting more and more kind of distant from what was <laughs> happening today. So I made the decision to go back into practice. And because of regulations and uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. GAH and all kinds of requirements, even though I was perfectly uh, qualified, very tough to get back in. And so at that time, I started looking into uh, industry because I knew guys like you <laughs> and seemed to be doing great. And I actually had an interview at uh, a few, uh, you know, big, big drug companies and they flew me down and picked me up in a limo. And, you know, we did that, that whole, <laughs> whole routine. And, uh, but at that time, I was kind of, uh, oh, I don't know, I guess more, uh, more naive and idealistic. And I remember uh, sitting in the lobby 
and it was it was like an airport atrium in New Jersey. I remember. I, I won't mm -hmm. mention the name of the company because I don't want to offend anybody. But and I had to sit and wait for my next appointment. It was beautiful lounge, and and at the up at the ceiling they had these TV monitors, and uh, which was kind of a new thing, you know, back then to have you know TVs on the wall and. But the TV didn't have a program. It had it had two digits, and I noticed that everybody was quite well dresses. Also, you know, pretty uh, oh yeah. dresses. Uh, you know, the uh. men, uh, and the, you know, the women and the men would would sort of stroll to whatever their next destination was across this giant uh, atrium and look up, and they would all glance at this, you know, TV, and then you know continue on their way, and it just had two numbers on it that I think rarely changed and I, I couldn't figure it out and uh, finally you know when I was in my I said by the way you know what what is that up there well it was the stock price <laughs> of the uh of that the, makes sense yeah <laughs> and uh, you know which if you work at the company it's a pretty important thing uh, oh, yeah. but that kind of sort of somehow was symbolic of the corporate world to me and and I felt that it really wasn't going to work for me. So let's talk about small pharma versus big pharma. Does that matter? You know, here I am. I'm, you know, I think I really love medicine. But, you know, I think what you said, one of the sort of super kind of redeeming value of working in pharma, uh, and this is true even in politics, is instead of helping one person at a time, you know, something you do like get, you know, Depakote approved, you're going to help thousands and thousands of people yeah. and not just, you know, the next, the next, I mean, cause you only do so much in, in a day. And yeah. so that's pretty exciting. So if I were going to start out in pharma, should I look for like a little company that's got 20 people, you know, out on 128 outside of Boston, or do I want to go with Pfizer, you know, or does it matter? Well, you know, it does matter. Um, there is a big difference between, little and big pharma. And it's pretty much why I think what you might guess. Um, in the little pharma, you have a much more personal contact. And because it's small, you'll, you'll tend to have more of an influence on decisions. Um, but that said, I think a decisive factor is what sorts of drugs they're developing and what areas they're in. You, know, you have to be happy in the uh, area that you've chosen. Uh, and I don't, you know, big pharma is more impersonal. Um, it's big, but on the other hand, you have a lot more resources. You have a lot more backing um, and you get, you know, to be involved in um, really, in, uh, you know, you, 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 get in, you get in with important projects no matter where you go, but more so in big pharma. Uh, and you have resources in big pharma that are tremendous. In right. small pharma, you, you, you're, a, you're able to influence decision-making more and it's more personal. But you know the, the caveat is, even in a small company, people don't, may not get along. Um, I use the example of GW and, and I hope now Xenon where people really seem to cooperate extremely well with each other. But you know, I have been in companies where it maybe wasn't as good a, a situation. Um, so you know, for me, uh, personal interaction is important, I guess you could figure out. And, um, if, if, if you're working with people that aren't getting along, it's, it's very unpleasant and very hard to get things done. But if you're in a cooperative environment, it's tremendous. It's yeah, like yeah, having, you know, yeah, you go know, ahead. Budget my energy. So, uh, go at 20%, I'm going to become an expert in whatever field opioids or epilepsy. So that's 20%. And, mm -hmm. 20% I'm going to learn how pharma works and the structure and interaction, 10% mm -hmm. about my competitors. And mm -hmm. what percent of my sort of mental energy has to go into navigating the politics of the corporate world? Yeah, that depends on the company. Um, you know, it, if it's, you know, a, a larger company, you're probably going to have to spend more time on that. Uh, and by that, I don't mean so much the personalities as the structure which you just alluded to, you know, you've got a, a committee for this or a committee for that or a group for that. And you have to figure out who you, who you should go to for each issue. And, and there are people around to help you, but sometimes it can be very difficult. You know, you would think, oh, that's, that's easy. You know, you just go to the communities. 
the committee or the group that you're supposed to, but um, yeah, you have to keep people in the loop. And unfortunately, I, I've made my mistakes where I didn't keep people in the loop, not, not uh, on purpose at all, but people find out you're doing something and they should have been included and you get some bad karma <laughs> from that, even though you didn't mean it. Um, it's, it's the way sometimes it happens. So I think, you know, there's no one answer to all that, Andy, but I think in general, in, in big pharma, you're going to be navigating that sort of thing. Whereas in the, the smaller companies, it should be a, a bit easier and not, not quite as challenging. Okay. Well, I think we're going over time. I have about three more hours of discussion for you, <laughs> but uh, to wrap up, if I came to you and um, and I said, I said, Ken, you know, I, I love what I'm doing, <laughs> but I need a change. I want to go into pharma. You know, I've been in practice. Uh, what's my first step? What do I do? Well, the first would be, I think, um, to look if there's um, a lot of times you have these headhunters, you know, who are helping people. Um, they often have people getting into the industry and they have experience in that. So if you can find someone like that who, who has done that sort of work, it's good to talk to them because then they may be able to steer you, first of all, to a company that might be looking for someone. Mm -hmm. And second of all, um, they can tell you about their own experience and, and what happens. Now, they're, they're obviously not going to be able to tell you on a level, granular level, but they can give you a lot of uh, general uh, advice about how to go. So, you know, I, this, that's off the top of my head, what, what you could do. I was lucky. I was called into the industry. So I had people already um, to talk to who, who, you know, could guide me. But, you know, if you're just de novo going out after it, that might be uh, another possibility would be to call someone like me. You know, if you have a friend who's in the industry and you want to go over things, that's happened to me a number of times. And I really do enjoy that. I do like, you know, talking to people about it because as we said earlier, it's not for everyone. And, and you, you know, the more you know, the better off, you know, you'll be, but nothing is quite like you think it is till you get there. <laughs> it's going to be, uh, um, I think, uh, if you really like research and being on cutting edge, that's one thing. The other thing is making sure you can work in a team. Because in the corporate world, whether, whether it's big or little pharma, you have to work in a team and you have to know how to do that. And it may sound easy, but it's not quite as easy as it seems. And, and you have, you know, look, what we talked about, keeping everyone in the loop and, and being mindful that, you know, as a practitioner in my own private practice, I ruled the roost, but you don't in pharma. You know, you're, you're one more employee, not, not that it's that bad, but you're in a much more cooperative environment with a lot of people and you need to adjust to that. So those would be the things. Now, one other thing, uh, Andy, some physicians have successfully joined the industry and kept up their clinical skills by going to a clinic each week and all. I think that's the exception. I, I know I haven't been able to do it. I, I, I did a little bit, but not much. Uh, are my clinical skills as good? No, I don't know. Probably not. But, you know, you'll, you'll get it back. Um, I gave a lecture at the University of Pittsburgh to the young physicians about the industry and the approval process. And I still remember at the very end, someone asked me about, you know, if, if you see something in the drug development that, that's important, um, you know, how you handle that. And my answer was, never forget who you are, ever. You don't give up being a physician when you join the industry. You are a physician in the industry. And that has a, a tremendous amount of responsibility with it. And one other thing, the, the pharma industry respects you. And they, they didn't hire you to be a non-physician. They hired you to be a physician. So never stop being one. Ken, this has been great. I want to thank you for uh, sharing your uh, experience and expertise with us. Uh, I think this has been a, a great starting point. And uh, really, uh, you've given us a, a lot of uh, things to, to think about. So thanks very much. Oh, you're very welcome. And I hope the young people out there who are thinking about it will give it serious thought. And I'll be happy if, if someone, you know, wants to talk to me, I'll be more than happy to talk to them as well. well that's, that's a generous offer. So I, I'm going to say contact me <laughs> and uh, I'll forward on your uh, contact information to uh, Dr. Somerville. Thanks. Okay. Both. Fair enough. Okay. Well, thanks for having me, Andy.